Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and uh, welcome to our session on exploring the new frontiers of growth. I'm Robert Guest. I'm the business editor of The Economist magazine based out of London. Um, and I'll be uh, chairing the, uh, the, the panel this morning, which means I will try to say as little as possible and I'll try to get as, as much value as I possibly can out of our distinguished panelists. Um, we have here uh, Hans-Paul Bruckner, who is the Global Chief Executive Officer and President from the Boston Consulting Group in Germany. Um, we have uh, Luis Moreno from the uh, Inter-American Development Bank based out of Washington, D.C. And then uh, Bhaskar Chakravarti, uh, who is uh, a professor at uh, Tufts University, the Fletcher School of Business in America. Uh, we have Mr. Gao Jifan, who is the uh, founder and uh, chief executive officer of Trina Solar. Um, and we have uh, Ashish Thakar, who's the founder of the uh, Mara Group, uh, a group with uh, many and wide interests uh, in Africa. So let's kick off. I'm going to try and ask, uh, and the subject we're trying to deal with today is where are we going to get new growth in the world? So we'll be looking at uh, emerging markets, um, South-South economic cooperation, um, what we think about the various new development models, um, and uh, possibly a bit about fostering frugal innovation. Now, I'm going to start by asking each of the panelists to talk for just two minutes. We're looking for very uh, short uh, presentations from you, and then I'm going to throw in questions um, and keep it going. Um, and we'll also allow some time for uh, audience questions towards the end. So uh, please uh, think about what it is that you'd like to ask each uh, panelist towards the end. Um, perhaps if we could start with uh, Hans Paul. Now, uh, the Boston Consulting Group has uh, just put out a, a rather sober report on um, China saying that uh, the biggest, most dynamic companies here are going to find it a little bit harder in the future to uh, rack up the same stratospherically high growth rates as before. Um, what's happened? Is this a change of view? No, not at all. I, I think uh, just be, uh, because growth rates are coming down maybe from 30, 40, 50 percent down to uh, 10, 20 percent uh, doesn't mean that we are uh, pessimistic. It just means that uh, I think growth uh, has always something, uh, is always something that has to be earned, and it's uh, a challenge. Um, uh, but um, I think overall uh, we remain very optimistic about the opportunities in China, but also the other emerging markets and the world overall. I think there is, um, in, it's where uh, I would emphasize, you know, we, we'll see lots of opportunities for more growth if we open up uh, more opportunities for the private sector. I think we still have, not just in China, but in many emerging markets, and by the way, also some of the European uh, countries, we find lots of obstacles for private companies, for private individuals to really engage, to take the initiative to build businesses. Um, and, uh, and I think that will be a, a major, major uh, new frontier for growth um, in, in all kinds of sectors, but also in, in places like healthcare, education, and so forth. And then I think, you know, with more and more entrants, I think we'll see also more opportunities for uh, competition, for uh, improving uh, productivity. I think we should not underestimate that um, in, in many places, not just in China, I think there are quite a number of state-owned companies dominating things, um, dominating markets, dominating the the credit um, um, market and so forth, and thus uh, are able to really have a relatively uh, easy going. I think it will be very important to uh, open up these markets, uh, and you know that's, as I said, not only true for emerging markets, but also in Europe, if you think of what the Troika suggests to Greece and other uh, southern European countries, uh, opening up markets, providing opportunities for individuals to take initiative to build their business. The Arab Spring, I think, is also a good example of what um, I think drives um, uh, growth. We will see a lot more growth in the uh, Arab countries because uh, people are able to build businesses and we will see significant increases in productivity way beyond what we have seen over the last uh, 20 years. Thank you very much. Let's uh, move straight on to uh, Luis Moreno. Um, your, your, your your focus is on uh, Latin America, but uh, presumably you have something to say about not only what the, uh, the new growth is going to come from in Latin America, but also about the, 
the, the links between uh, Latin America and other emerging markets. We see Brazil and China, for example, in a, an embrace. Perhaps you could tell us something about your thoughts. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and, and I'd like to, to, I guess, compliment some of the things that, that Hans was saying in the following sense. You know, if you look at the last 10 years, a lot of the growth has been coming from emerging markets, a lot of the world growth and, and the, 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 the trajectory coming certainly from Asia, but it's also from Africa. It will be more and more uh, from uh, uh, Middle East and Northern Africa countries as uh, things happen towards the future, and certainly Latin America is no exception. So the big thing to me is um, the growth of the middle classes, and this is a phenomenon that will happen not only in Latin America, but throughout the emerging markets. In the very case of Latin America, if we are to keep uh, at the rates of growth that we have observed over the last 10 years, and by the way, these are not uh, as sexy as the growths in Asia, which are, you know, on average close to 10%, but on the contrary, uh, Latin America has been uh, trend growth close to 5%. If we were just to be close to that over the next 15 years, we will not only double the size of the GDP in Latin America, but the, perhaps the most important thing is that no longer we will have a third of our population in poverty, we will have 10% 10, 10 of our population in poverty. That means that in essence, in a generation, you're going to have 500 million Latin Americans in the middle classes, defined by $10 of income per capita a, a day at a minimum. And that provides for a profound change in opportunities inside domestic markets. It provides for a, a, an immense change uh, for how governments need to develop, uh, deploy uh, public services. Uh, but more importantly, the, the challenges in the areas that uh, Hans was uh, mentioning around productivity, because this is going to be the fundamental key. And, we are, and this is not going to be a smooth process. I think this is going to be a process where you have, on the one hand, what we already observe, high levels of criminality, uh, youth unemployment, which is, by the way, a phenomenon across uh, emerging markets. We have a demographic bonus in Latin America, average age of 27. Uh, that is very different than most countries in Asia, by the way. More, certainly more different than in all... It's very different from China, not so very different from India. True. I think India has that same demographic bonus, like Latin America, average 27. Uh, so we have a, a time to do some of these uh, profound changes. The fundamental difference of Latin America to Asia, especially countries like India and China, is that already 75% of our population lives in cities. And there's always a tremendous dislocation that takes place in that transit from farm to factory, in people coming into cities, certainly in the experience that Latin America lived, I think China is doing much better in that regard, but certainly that uh, provides for uh, a certain amount of uh, the location. So China is doing better in, can you, can you explain that? Well, when you had uh, people in Latin America in the 60s and 70s coming from farms to cities, mm -hmm. from the rural areas to the urban areas, with the promise that they would find better jobs, very quality jobs, mm -hmm. it didn't necessarily happen because there was not an absorption capacity. Mm -hmm. And in as much as that absorption capacity wasn't there, all of a sudden you created these huge pools of poverty that were very difficult to change uh, uh, over the years. Mm -hmm. And that created for a lot of social dislocation. And that, of course, came in the case of Latin America in a period of 25 years in which we had 31 financial crises, and we all know what financial crises do to societies. Uh, we learned the hard way, and no surprise, Latin America with the financial crisis didn't get any effects other than the transmission channel that came from the collapse of trade as opposed to the financial channel. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Luis. Uh, uh, Bhaskar, perhaps you could give us, in a nutshell, your perspective on where the new frontiers of growth are going to be. Well, I uh, will reinforce uh, what my colleagues to the left have, have just said, and uh, perhaps just to kind of set the context. I find it helpful to look forward and look back to uh, you know, set this discussion in, in, in the framing of, uh, of history and the future. Um, uh, my old firm, uh, slightly less uh, reputable than Boston Consulting Group, McKinsey, has just uh, put up... Uh, uh, put out, uh, I do agree with you. <laughs> a flag out there which says that by 2025, more than uh, half the world's population is going to be in that middle class that Lewis was just talking about, is going to be living... Uh, on at least $10 a day in, in, in purchasing uh, power parity terms. 
which is a momentous event. If you, if you just, do the, uh, just do the arithmetic associated with that transformation, this coming industrial revolution, if I may call it that, is going to be about a thousand times that of the industrial revolutions that we have seen uh, that affected the, uh, the Western world. So when I look at that marker and then I look at history, um, we have a number of economic historians who have basically declared the end of innovation, the end of technology. They are saying that there's no great technological breakthrough that's in, on the horizon. There's nothing like the internal combustion engine or electricity or internal in, indoor plumbing uh, that is up ahead. So let's assume they're right. I don't know whether they're right or wrong. Let's assume they're right. So there's no great breakthrough up ahead. I know that there are some enormous changes that are taking place as we speak. More than half the world's population lives in cities. Uh, in some parts of the world, the, uh, for instance, in Europe, there are more people retiring than there are people entering the workforce. In places like Latin America, uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, India, uh, there are, the problem is at the other end, and the problem at the other end is that there are all these people who are waiting to get into the workforce, and they don't have the skills. Now, how do we close the gap? How do we create industrial revolution a thousand times of what we have experienced in the past without some of the basic tools uh, with us in terms of technological breakthroughs or, uh, or, or you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the people uh, that, that, that are required to make that happen? And my sense is that we are going to live through a revolution in the next 10 or 15 years, and that revolution is going to be a messy one. It's not going to be uh, uh, of the kind that we've experienced over the last two centuries. I'm happy to talk about that as we get into the discussion. Okay. I mean, that, that's an interesting... I mean, in, in a way, I mean, I, I very much doubt that um, the people who tell you that there's not another industrial revolution is coming are, are, are correct. But in a way, for, for your purposes, it doesn't matter because even if there is another industrial revolution coming, there's still an awful lot of knowledge that we already have that's already out there that we want to spread to uh, the people who don't have the advantages of it yet. I mean, you know, the, the, the first few industrial revolutions haven't spread everywhere yet, and that's, that's a catch-up uh, phase of growth that, that, that very much needs to happen. Um, I'm going to move uh, brutally on to um, Mr. Mr. Gao Ji Fan. Um, now, uh, you, you, you founded a large uh, solar energy company. I'm sure you have lots of interesting things to say about um, solar energy. I mean, how, how much... How much of a part of the, the, the new growth that we're going to see in the world is going to have to come from breakthroughs in energy? And what do you see happening? Okay. Okay, sorry, I speak uh, Chinese. Uh, I think you all know that the percentage the percentage of the population developed to borrow accounts for 15 percent to 20 percent. However, the percentage of the economy developed countries accounts for more than 80 percent. So in the future, the growth of developing countries will have a huge impact on the future growth of the economy. And the key issue in the development of the developing country is the energy structure. In the development of the developing country is the energy structure and the resources limitations. So that is to say, in those areas, whether there will be the same energy structure to support the growth, which is similar as that of the developed countries, which is impossible. Because in developing countries and in underdeveloped areas, in the future, we will see a completely new energy structure to support their growth. And in this energy structure, solar and wind power will play a very large part. Now you see that the renewable energy the cost of the renewable energies is getting lower and lower, which is quite similar as the traditional energy. So in the new energy structure, well, we can say that some countries have a lot of them, and some countries do not have a lot of them, especially for solar energy. Most countries have a lot of solar energy. Maybe some people will say that solar energy might not be possible to, to become a large proportion of the energy mix, but they're wrong. I would like to give you an example. For example, in China, in Xinjiang area, in Xinjiang area, 
全部看看的。从它的总的能源供给来讲，能够供全中国所有的能源的。And the energy produced can supply the home country and satisfy the need of the home country. This is the case. So, in general, the other countries have the same potential in solar energy. In 2010 and in the next five years, we will see the cost of solar energy continue to decrease. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix that will replace the current energy mix. We will see the emergence of a new energy mix In that particular area, you can satisfy the requirement of those mining energies. As you all know, that now there are 1.5 billion dollars of people in China that do not have electricity. So if you can harness the potential of solar energy, you can better satisfy the people's needs. Okay, so this is the energy mix. 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 Um, I'm going to move swiftly on to Ashish Thakkar, um, who uh, you, 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 you have a view on you know, the other big, exciting new growth market of what's going on in Africa. And okay, it's not one market, it's lots of markets. But um, what, you know, how, how significant do you think uh, African growth is going to be over the next decade or so? I mean, in the past decade, it's been the, the fastest growing part of the world, but from a very, very, very low base. Um, so it hasn't... You know, people are excited about it, but it hasn't really started to move markets the way China does. Well, what do you see in the next 10 years? I am, I'm, I'm absolutely optimistic. I think, you know, Africa is, is the next big thing. And I think it's pretty evident. Everybody is getting excited about it. If you look at the size of the continent, you know, the sheer size, Africa is larger than North America, Western Europe, India, China put together um, physically. We have over a billion people as a continent. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa, maybe 80% of our population is under the age of 35. So I think we have a very young population. We've got a lot of natural resources. So I think we're definitely headed in the right direction. And as you rightly said, you know, you can't generalize the continent. And um, out of the 54 countries that Africa has, if you take out North Africa, uh, which is the eight countries, you know, you're looking at about 46 Sub-Saharan African countries. So, I mean, it's a, it's a huge continent with huge opportunity because every country has its own dynamics. Um, in terms of the growth models, in our, in our opinion, um, you know, I think foreign direct investment is obviously one key factor uh, that we are looking at. But again, I think it's very important to have sensitive foreign direct investment, meaning I think the foreign investors do need to be aware of what the local countries' demands and the requirements are. Um, and, you know, kind of adding value to our local produce, not just taking, extracting our raw materials and exporting them. Um, obviously, our governments are very, very bullish on public-private partnerships, which is another key model of growth because, obviously, you know, we've, we have a huge requirement for infrastructure, energy, um, a lot of the other industries that have been mentioned. And, obviously, governments um, have the resources but not, not the right ability to in terms of management. So I think the public-private partnership mechanism is key. But I think I also am very ex excited and very focused on the small-medium enterprise um, section as well and, and our nonprofit arm, the Mara Foundation, is actually focused on um, bolstering that growth. Mm -hmm. Let's, I'm wondering if I can throw the discussion towards a little bit um, to do with South-South uh, cooperation. And by that, I mean uh, not necessarily people who are just in the Southern Hemisphere, but um, countries that we think of as emerging markets and uh, the extent to which they're really getting the links right with each other. Um, maybe if we could start with s some thoughts on China in Africa, and, 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 and since you're, you're the man on the spot, I mean, how do you see China's role there? I think um, China, China's role is obviously, you know, it's, it's, it is critical for Africa, and, and China is playing a very active role in Africa. I think we've seen a lot of great case studies, mm -hmm. um, and we've seen a few negative ones as well. Um, 
it's obviously important not to generalize, and, and hence it's important to kind of pick and mix. But this is why I'm saying that the great case studies are, are few but very large, mm -hmm. right, who, who have actually done it very professionally, who are doing it extremely well. Uh, well one great example, actually, is the China-Africa Development Fund, who's, mm -hmm. who's very focused on, on deploying funds in Africa and in the right manner. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you do get a lot of, a lot of uh, the, the negative side as well, who are actually coming to do things uh, in a manner where they're really trying to just extract the wealth and move on. And, mm -hmm. and I think we've seen this from China, we've seen it from India, we've seen it from quite a few different markets. Um, so I think that's, that's a challenge, how you kind of balance that and how you make sure that it's mm -hmm. done correctly. Okay. I mean, Bhaskar, you were, you were saying earlier when we were discussing things um, in, in the speaker's room that um, you've, 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 you've run into companies who want to do business in China and they're asked to surrender your intellectual property and they say no and then they're told, um, well, you know, if you don't, not only are you going to be shut out of China, but you're going to be shut out of Africa because we're now the gatekeepers there. Um, do, do you think that that's a bluff? I mean, that sounds like a bluff to me. Do you think how much of this sort of stuff is going on? Well, th th that is a, that's a, that's kind of hard to speculate on. And whether something is a bluff or not doesn't really matter as long as it works. And, yes. uh, and I think well, uh, for a good a lot, bluff works, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, uh, for a lot of uh, particularly American companies, uh, this is a, a real challenge because uh, Americans are not particularly comfortable operating uh, on a global stage. Uh, mm -hmm. American companies have uh, been used to uh, essentially the United States being the center of the world and uh, has a certain amount of comfort in the conventional uh, Western environments. And some of these new markets that are opening up, uh, you know, there hasn't been that historical connection uh, that a lot of uh, European uh, multinationals have had uh, with, the, with the wider world and certainly the South-South connections that mm -hmm. the, the Southern uh, uh, corporations have had. So in response to your question, uh, the, the, the challenge for a lot of uh, global players is to understand uh, the cross-connect between operating businesses across borders and the geopolitical implications of what they are doing in terms of their entry strategies, in terms of their pricing strategies, and how you take products from one geography and replicate in another in a way that is uh, representative of the needs and the usage context of these different geographies. Traditionally, uh, uh, the American model has been uh, to create a perfect product and then re and replicate it over and over again go up the, uh, the, the scale curve and, uh, and, and bring down the costs and be enormously efficient at, at essentially producing the same product around the world. Now, that model cannot work when you have so many different south, south markets, and each market has its own uh, peculiar idiosyncratic needs. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a lesson that uh, not, not just American companies, but uh, European and uh, southern organizations need to understand. Mm -hmm. Um, perhaps I could ask Lewis to um, jump in here. I mean, you've, you've presumably seen a lot of uh, the, the trade between Latin America uh, and China. You've seen how uh, Brazil, for example, has, 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 has made a huge boom on the back of selling you know, iron ore and oil and various minerals and agricultural products to China. I mean, how, how do you see the, the relationship and how could it be better? Well, certainly it's the, the biggest story of the last decade in Latin America is the huge impact that China trade has had, especially on South America. I don't see it being the same for, say, Central America, the Caribbean, and Mexico, which are still largely connected to the U.S. market. In fact, uh, trade between Mexico and the United States is about 80% of total trade of Mexico. But well, they're quite close to each other. So, so that comes, of course, with NAFTA and everything else. But it's also a question of, of, of real estate, it's location. Okay, it's obvious that, that Central America and, and, and Mexico are gonna be far more connected, but that's changing. Yet, the case of South America, uh, today you have uh, Brazil, the largest economy in all of Latin America. Uh, its number one trading partner is China. It's no longer mm -hmm. the United States. That is also the case for Peru. Mm -hmm. It's been the case for Chile for some time. And at these growth rates, it will probably be the same for both Argentina and Colombia in the next five years. So in essence, China trade with South America especially has been of profound impact. The big question is, can India be the next big thing, for instance? And mm -hmm. here, what you find is still that there is a tremendous gap in transportation lines, 
in, in uh, levels of protection. But I believe that India eventually uh, will become a very important market for Latin America. You do see major Indian companies with tremendous presence throughout the region. And so what, in essence, you're getting is a very different kind of mix, combined with the fact that something that, as I was, was mentioning, is the growth of emerging global companies from our region. Today, for instance, in Latin America, you have over 100 companies that are listed in the uh, stock markets in the U.S., uh, which are global in nature. Not only do they have a strong presence in Latin America, they are now looking at the huge opportunities that present themselves not only in Europe, in the U.S., and increasingly looking at Asia. Mm -hmm. Plus Africa, actually. Uh, and, and, and Brazil, is, that's a very good, good point that, that Hans make, it makes. Is uh, There's a tremendous, I, I think the one country, and this is a lot, President Lula, who was really focused on, on, on Africa, and mm -hmm. did a tremendous effort, and today you have huge investments taking place from, from Brazil into Africa. And when you think about it, the, the distance between African countries and certainly some of sub-Saharan African countries and Brazil are in many cases closer even than, yeah. than, than the, uh, uh, the U.S. and others. So what you have in essence is that on the one hand, the Pacific side of Latin America has benefited from the trans-Pacific trade. Mm -hmm. But as Africa does better, the east side of Latin America will do better with Africa, and this is the connection to... Well, uh, we, plus, we, plus these companies, of course, understand from, from other emerging markets, from Latin America, from China, India, and so forth, they do understand the, the needs and opportunities in emerging markets. They're able to deal with uh, infrastructure that is uh, far from perfect much better. They are able to deal with uh, more difficult um, political systems, uh, judicial systems, and so forth, far better than maybe some of the Americans, as you said, and, or the European companies. Yeah, and if they're Brazilian and they're going to Angola or Mozambique, then they speak the language. They're used to dealing with oil and minerals. They have a lot to, a lot to say about agriculture. I mean, sort of Brazilian agriculture has amazing potential for, uh, for, for improving productivity in Africa. Um, perhaps I, I could ask Mr. Gao, um, what do you think other southern countries um, should be doing, other emerging markets should be doing to encourage more Chinese investment? And what do you think Chinese investors should be doing to make themselves more welcome? For China, yeah, in my opinion, I think it is a very good thing for Chinese companies to cooperate with uh, companies from emerging economies, especially from Africa. Well, over the last decade, we can see that uh, Africa has uh, emerged uh, a relatively more developed market than 10 years before. So the presence of Chinese companies in Africa has played a very helpful role in boosting the local economy because uh, Chinese companies can bring in new thinking, new ways of production, new ways of doing business into Africa. And by doing business with uh, Africa, with African uh, counterparts, I believe there are a lot of of complementarities uh, to tap into between the two continents, so we could uh, generate a lot of win-win results through uh, cooperation with uh, African countries. And at the same time, I believe uh, for Latin American countries and for European countries, they would have a lot of cultural and even language links with African countries, as uh, the fellow speakers have said, uh, they speak the same language. And and share similar culture. And for us, I believe um, Africa should become more, more open to the uh, uh, Asian economies like Asian uh, China, China and especially they should open further open up their doors to China companies, companies, to Chinese companies, to Chinese investments, so that they could absorb even more expertise and knowledge to improve the, the quality of their development. I think that would be a very positive influence on 
uh, African economic development. So my view is that uh, we are very optimistic about the further future cooperation between African companies and Chinese companies. We believe we can play a big role in Africa. Thank you. May, may I ask if this is not too um, simple and stupid a question? Um, Africa, a lot of very sunny areas where not many people live, you know, the Sahara Desert. How much potential for solar power do you see there? I mean, could you be powering the whole of Africa with solar panels on the Sahara? Uh, Yes, indeed. What are the characteristics of the uh, African continent? There are three characteristics. First, the energy structure of Africa right now is rather weak, and uh, Africa is still underdeveloped. But at the same time, that means the potential for further development is huge. And also, secondly, uh, solar resources are very abundant in Africa. So I believe in the next 10 to 20 years, Africa's energy structure will be totally different from that in China, in America, in Europe. I believe in Africa they should build an energy structure that is solar dominant. Of course, they need to develop energy saving, energy conservation um, technologies as well as uh, um, develop a small proportion of uh, fossil fuel-based energy to complement their solar-dominant um, energy structure. Unlike other markets, which have to shut down conventional uh, coal-based generation plants to open new energy sector. I believe Africa could start from scratch by first and foremost develop its, uh, by developing its solar energy sector. So I, I agree to the moderator's view. It is uh, very realistic for us to install solar panels on the Saharan desert. Thank you. There is actually there is actually a big project underway, Desert Tech, by a number of European, in particular German companies, uh, in in North Africa to use the uh, the sun in Sahara uh, to produce uh, uh, energy for Africa, but also for Europe. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the ideas we're supposed to be uh, discussing here is, is frugal innovation. And, you know, we've all heard the, the stories about the incredibly cheap heart monitors from India um, and the, 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 the great progress that's being made in both India and China in coming up with um, consumer products from cars to fridges that are an order of magnitude cheaper and therefore uh, are appealing to the, the new middle class that uh, Bhaskar was talking about earlier. I mean, what, what are the new ideas out there that people have seen? Does anyone on the panel want to volunteer particularly good, cheap ideas that they've seen or particularly good ways of, of fostering cheap ideas? Do we have a, a volunteer? Bhaskar? Yeah, I, I, I guess there are examples. Uh, uh, there are lots of examples that one can pick from, uh, from across the world. Uh, one class of examples that I find fascinating, and this is tied to the point about urbanization, uh, which is that if you visit a slum in uh, Brazil or Venezuela or India or uh, in Kenya, they all sort of look the same. And somehow, when you think about the global uh, citizen, uh, the global citizenry uh, looks incredibly similar in slums, no matter where you go. And uh, I've also found uh, that uh, not only do people who live in extremely congested parts of cities in, developing, in the developing world look the same, they also have similar needs because they're all human. The way they solve those needs are also quite similar. They use available materials, available technologies, um, available communities to solve problems uh, in ways that are incredibly creative. So uh, some, something as simple as uh, in, in, in a slum in Manila, uh, which was is basically a tin box uh, with no light in, in, in the living quarters, uh, the slum dwellers have taken a plastic bottle, something like this, filled it with water, stuck a, a, created a hole in the roof, and stuck the bottle up there. And uh, that generates, uh, during the day, the equivalent of about 40 watts of light, uh, just a, a bottle of water inside a tin box. Now, that's pretty frugal. Now, that's just one example of a number of different innovations that have come out of slums, such as particularly innovations that relate to public health, sanitation, availability of water. And there are similar solutions being tried out across the world, 
and they're being tried out in a, uh, in a microcosmic setting. Now, what we need is the ability to connect all these ideas uh, because essentially people are trying to solve the same problems in different parts of the world using indigenous techniques. Mm. So I think that's one of the most fascinating developments of uh, frugal innovation that I've seen anywhere. Now, the ones that are talked about a little more frequently, like the Tata Nano, frankly, I think uh, the Tata Nano so far has done better in the pages of the Harvard Business Review than on the streets of India. <laughs> so uh, we do need to look at uh, the, the deeper uh, uh, more embedded examples of frugal innovation to really get a sense of uh, the kind of differences that... But I think the fact that the Tata Nano has not been as successful as it might have been is, I mean, you've got to expect that. I mean, when people are trying to innovate, some things work, some things fail. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, there, I, I, and it's very encouraging that there's lots of people out there trying to ask the question. I mean, um, perhaps a, 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 a rival of yours at a rival business school, Vijay Govindarajan at um, uh, Dartmouth Tuck School of Business, had sort of posed the question, you know, can we build uh, a proper house with modern amenities for $300? And um, he's got lots of ideas coming in, trying to think of ways of making everything much, much cheaper, which, which, which maybe it will not work at all. But if it does work, the, the consequences for, for, for people uh, in the new emerging middle class, the people who are making $10 a day, could be uh, immense. Um, before I throw it open to questions in the audience, so if you're thinking about what questions you would like to ask our esteemed panelists, think of you know, a question and who you would like to address it to. But before we do that, do we have any more um, thoughts on particularly good frugal ideas that need a better airing? But, Hans Paul. Can I just, I mean, I think we say the Nano has not been a success, but actually there have been many actually automotive companies have really introduced now low cost uh, cars. Not of course, not quite as low cost as the Nano, um, but uh, I think they are all coming up and trying to really um, uh, play a strong role in the emerging markets with uh, uh, much um, you know, more frugal cars. Um, the same is true with, when you look at furniture, when you look at um, all kinds of, of white goods and so forth. So I think, um, I think the, the whole idea, and it goes back to what Baskar said about the, uh, uh, the middle class or, you know, the people ha in the emerging markets have this aspiration to really build uh, a, a standard of living for them. Um, and, and to have for, for their children a better future. And that drives enormous uh, efforts in all kinds of, of, of ways, of course, you know, as consumers, but also as, as, as uh, workers, as, uh, as entrepreneurs. And I think that really, uh, and, you know, that's still what four to five billion people um, in trying to enter the, the global economy. And I think that is the major driver of, of many of the changes that we're going to mm -hmm. see. I think just re-emphasizing what, what you said earlier, and I think we should not underestimate you know, how much change that will bring to every uh, city, every, even every village you know, around the world, and involve so many more people than just the one billion that are living in, uh, in North America, Europe, and, uh, and then Japan and, and Australia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Luis. Oh, real quickly, um, I think one of the more interesting things as we talk about these middle classes is the role of women and how they change consumer behaviors. I think this is extremely important at how that is changing uh, in, in emerging markets uh, because it is woman behavior that begins to, to change the habits and the tastes of families and the kinds of desires that family has in, a, in all kinds of services from traditional public services to things like public goods like education. The other part is the innovation that is taking place in consumer goods. And again, I, I would uh, uh, go to the point that Bashkar make is here there is a, a lot of disruption taking place and a lot of companies that are local in nature have an opportunity to become global because they basically are seeing opportunities that global companies are not seeing. And here in consumer goods, there's extremely interesting uh, examples. Finally, there is, all this is happening at a time we, where we have tremendous connectivity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I th Latin America today is uh, the, the region of the world with the highest penetration of cellular telephones. Yes, we Latinos mm -hmm. love to talk. Uh, and uh, there, I think, the apps that will be developed to run on these systems that will take some time is going to be another source of all these disruptive business models that Basha was mentioning. So. This is not going to be a time where these things are going to happen orderly because 
we have the tools to begin to close those gaps. Finally, on the traditional things, you know, take the case of energy. Energy, we will need, in the case of Latin America, between now and 2030, about $1.8 trillion in investment. That's not going to happen from governments. That's going to happen in some sort of public-private partnership that is going to have in all kinds of, of different models. I give you the case of solar, a country like Nicaragua, we've financed projects where people in a rural area where there's no electricity at all mm -hmm. have a solar panel, they go and charge a battery every day, and they get lighting for, for two or three bulbs in the house. And it's the difference of having light of not having light at all or having something. Mm -hmm. And it's these kinds of things is the, the, the example of the ball that, that more and more we're going to start to see that have a capacity to change people's uh -huh. lives in ways okay. that we don't even understand. Um, I noticed, Mr. Gao, you're, you're nodding there. Do you want to say something about, possibly about how to make energy cheaper or things you've seen? Anyway, <coughs> Yes, I find this topic very interesting. We are talking about how to do innovation in a cheap way. I think this uh, topic would be very beneficial for the uh, low-income people so that low-income people can benefit from the results of innovation. I believe my fellow speakers are um, those who live in urban areas with high-income, very successful careers. But there are millions and millions of people who live in the countryside with no access to water or electricity. I believe all of you have been to those poor, underdeveloped areas. For those underprivileged people, if we could do innovation, uh, can create value for these poor people, that would be to be doing something meaningful. For example, in uh, in Western and uh, Northern provinces in China, over the uh, last 20 years, there has been a very good cheap innovation uh, experience called the cheap solar energy house. That building such a cheap house, well, you, during winter, you can uh, heat up the room through your solar panels installed on the rooftop, then you would not feel so cold in winter. So for those uh, rural villages scattered around Western provinces in China, they would uh, have access to Solar energy, geothermal energy, if we could do innovation and provide better access to electricity in those areas, I believe we could greatly improve the quality of living in those poor areas. So I believe if we make best use of solar energy, and other renewable energies, then it will create a huge social value for those people. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ashish, quickly, before I throw it open. Sure. I think, um, you know, I think just echoing what Lewis mentioned, I think the tech innovation side is another huge angle. I mean, in our nonprofit incubation center, we've got an innovation side, which, you know, you could see so many apps coming up, from medical apps to, to you know, local logistic uh, apps and everything else. But one, one, of, one of the most successful uh, innovative um, things we've seen in our region is obviously the mobile money angle, which has been absolutely game-changing for us. The number of transactions done on mobile money changed the way people manage themselves. So I think, I think there has been a lot of innovation space in, in that. But that's completely transformed the way things operate in, in Kenya, for example. It used to be you'd sort of give money to a bus driver to take to your mother in the village, and it would get there eventually, and now you just ping it on a mobile which phone. Which is now a lot of sub-Saharan Africa. Now. Yeah. Um, I'm going to throw it open. If you can uh, remember two things. Firstly, introduce yourself, say who you are, address your question uh, to a particular member of the panel, uh, and please make it a question, not a speech. Um, if you can raise your hand um, if you'd like to ask something. Yes, I have one over in the back there. Good morning. I'm from Phoenix Business. My question is for Mr. Gao. Currently, there's a countervailing case from European Union to the solar industry in China. So what kind of approaches that you have adopted to counter that? Besides, do you think there's overcapacity in the solar energy in China? Thank you. Thank you. This is a very specific question. 
Yes, indeed. We have seen that the European Union has established some cases targeted to solar energies in China. As a matter of fact, um, on 30th August, the leaders from both countries have had a meeting and they also talk about this issue, and they think that in every aspect of the business, of the industry and the economy, also include the solar industry, there should not be such kind of um, countervailing actions. So although there, they have, the European side have established such a case, however, because the, at the government, government level, the leaders are communicating with each other and relevant departments are communicating with each other. So I hope that in the future, they can solve this issue in a smooth manner. Of course, in terms of the solar industry in China, in the past few years, we have seen excessive, uh, uh, rapid growth, and we also need to reflect that, reflect on that, to think about how can we have a much more sustainable development in the future, how can we better promote and stimulate innovations in this industry, so as to make China the largest manufacturing country in solar energy, but also the largest market in solar energy. We welcome competitors and companies in this industry from North America and from Europe and to gain their market shares in China. And also we hope to see that the Chinese companies can have a complement, complementary relationship with those companies from North America and Europe. Well, all in all, international cooperation and free trade is the key for the development of the solar industry. Because what is the key for solar energy? It is to make it much more accessible, to make it cheaper, to make it much more even cheaper than the traditional energy. So in the future, without government subsidy, it can become the dominant energy. So every people can enjoy the benefit of green energy. So indeed, in Europe, I've seen that some companies have established the kind of cases against China solar energy. However, I believe that in the future, the companies will have a rational thought about that. Well, as a matter of fact, I've already seen there's a coalition that consists of a hundred companies in Europe that are against these countervailing cases. Thank you. Okay, next question. Um, in the middle there, perhaps. Can we get a microphone down there, please? Lady with a raised hand. Thank you. Morning. My name is Amobola Johnson, Minister for Communication Technology in Nigeria. My question is for Thaka. You uh, mentioned the fact that you've seen a lot of innovation coming out of your incubation centers. And my question is, how do you, how have you scaled up that uh, innovation beyond the incubation centers? Thank you. Um, thank you. We, we actually have an entire program, um, which we're actually going to be looking at launching in Nigeria as well early next year. But we do from mentoring um, to incubation to the venture capital. So we kind of handhold them throughout the entire process to make sure that they go up to a certain level. And in terms of the tech innovators, um, our, our Mara Foundation, our nonprofit side, has actually announced that we're setting up a an incubation center in Silicon Valley uh, end of next year. So we're going to be looking at all of our hubs across Africa where we can pick out amazing tech entrepreneurs and actually take them into Silicon Valley and scale them up even further. Is that with a view to bringing them back to Africa afterwards? It's, it's a view to kind of take African companies and plugging them into Silicon Valley to give them a global platform. So it's really... Right. And a sense of the ideas that are coming out of there. Correct. Yeah. Great. Um, there are lots more questions out there. Uh, yes, gentleman on the edge there. Good morning. I'm from Hexin. My name is Fu Dong. I have a question. I have noted that we've just discussed the developments in emerging countries and developed countries. However, why is that the development growth rate in developed countries, emerging countries, also including Africa, are still relatively slow? 
So relatively speaking, countries that have the growth rate such as China is far and few between. So can you explain to us why is the reason for that? Thank you. Okay, who'd like to have a bash at this one? Actually, Africa's growth rates have been uh, very similar to those of China, in not everywhere, but in, in many places. So yes. I think it's not quite true what has been said. So there is enormous uh, um, momentum in Africa, certainly. Not, so, well, not quite as much in, in, in South America or Latin America, but certainly Africa is rivaling with its growth rate uh, China or parts of yeah. China. Your six I mean, or seven uh, of the fastest growing countries in the world are in sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. I so, mean, if the question is why, why do most countries not grow at 10%, I mean, that's, that's just the law of large numbers. If everyone was growing at 10%, we'd all be doubling every, every seven years, and, and, and that's just not sustainable over a long period of time. Luis? Well, that reminds me that um, I was in Peru a, a couple months ago, and here's a country that grew at an average rate of 7.8% over the last 10 years. Not bad. And uh, people were saying, it's terrible, we're only growing at 6. Well, I, I would say to our Chinese friends, not everybody grows at the rates of China. I mean, there's no, nothing in economic history that shows the kind of growth that China has had over the past few years. I believe on growth. The most important thing is to have consistent growth. I mean, what's terrible for any country is the ups and downs, and we lived that in Latin America for some time. There's a number of reasons why some countries grow faster than others, and that is as they are able to break down some of the things that prevent the growth. For instance, uh, lags in infrastructure are extremely important in preventing growth. Uh, gaps in education, all of these gaps that Basha was mentioning and, and everybody in one way or another has mentioned, all in one way or another contribute to the slowness of growth. Certainly, countries that came from, from behind have a, a, a big impact, like some of the African countries will see some of that big growth, but that was not sustainable over time. So that's, I think, the big issue that one needs to look um, at. You know, Basker, I'm going to throw it open to more questions because we don't have a whole lot of time left. So um, can, we, can we see hands again? Maybe there's something from over here. Yeah, gentlemen there. Can we, can we get a microphone over there, please? Thank you. I'm from Tianjin newspaper. I have a question. It's concerning frugal innovation or frugal development because the moderator have talked about an interconnection. That is to say, can we establish a house at the cost of $300? However, in China, in that kind of scenario, the first thing we'll think about is that the quality, whether the quality is good enough. So when we talk about frugal innovation, one of the big costs is in human resources. The human, uh, human cost is quite high. Also, the cost for raw materials are increasing. So my question is that when the costs are increasing, how can we achieve frugal innovation? So to what extent is frugal? And what kind of cost can you further decrease? Thank you. Okay. Uh, maybe Bhaskar, would you like to go Basca. that? Since I've if, if uh, uh, the English translation could just repeat the question, I couldn't pick up. Uh, well, maybe if I summarize yeah. it. Um, yeah. The cost of raw materials um, have been going up. Um, he's saying in, in, in China, you know, lots of materials cost a lot of money. And uh, also, it's all very well to have a very cheap house. But people in China will say, is the college nearby good enough? <clears throat> um, so you know, how can we have frugal innovation when you have those two constraints? Yeah, I, I think it's a really, uh, really good question. And uh, um, uh, no, matter, uh, no matter where you are, whether you're in China or in, in any other part of the world, whether it's in sub-Saharan Africa or Latin America or South Asia, uh, as there is greater and greater pressure on uh, available materials and resources, and it's not just the materials to build a house. Uh, one of the most scarce resources is clean water. And uh, as the cost of clean water or any material goes up, you know, the costs of frugal innovation are going to go up. And here uh, we do look at uh, the international implications of some of these, some of these uh, developments. So what we are seeing is uh, the cost of, uh, cost of material, cost of uh, water, cost of food is going up. More and more people are consuming meat. As a result, uh, we need to get more meat. We need more land. The cost of land goes up. So eventually... Uh, 
uh, this this revolution that I was talking about, you know, does have the messy implications that spill beyond the boundaries of these individual countries and goes back to the South-South connections. So we are beginning to see a race for uh, land, for water, for fuel sources, uh, for for commodities and minerals, uh, and that's primarily happening uh, on, on a South-to-South -south basis. So you see the Chinas, the Indias. Uh, the Saudi Arabias, the Indonesias of the world, uh, going out and seeking partnerships in uh, Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa in order to relieve the pressures. And eventually, uh, this is going to be a problem because when the Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, uh, those countries are going to look for uh, the, the, their source of water and materials. Where are they going to go? And this is a phenomenon that I, uh, that I call the pyramid scheme mm -hmm. at the bottom of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that this messy uh, 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 form of revolution could lead to a crisis that uh, we'll need some creative mm -hmm. solutions for. But okay. frugal, frugal innovation really is about using less resources. Um, no matter how, I mean, the more expensive they are, of course, we That's try to use less resources. And yesterday evening, I sat next to uh, Peter Frickman, who is uh, going for drip irrigation. You know, yep. and of course that's the best way of, of uh, or one way of, of using water more uh, frugally. That's, that's a great answer. We've got time for one more question. Over there, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ting Yan from China Business News, Di Taijing Rebao. Uh, I have a more general question. So, um, as we know, many Latin America countries are caught in the so-called middle income trap now. And many, China has entered a stage where many people are worried China might follow the same path. So my question is, what can China do to avoid getting into this middle-income trap? And are there any lessons from Latin American countries that we can learn? Thank you very much. Okay, that sounds like one for Luis. Well, this is an extremely yeah. important question. There was a recent study that was done by the World Bank that looked, I think it was the last 50 or 60 years, uh, that looked at how many countries were able precisely to get up that, out of that middle income trap. And of a total, if I, my memory doesn't fail me, it was about 110 countries, uh, of which only 13 were able to, in that space of time, uh, break the middle income trap. Uh, two of those countries are in some trouble these days. One is Greece, the other one is Spain. Um, so I mention that because this is an extremely difficult issue. And uh, the one issue that we think about all the time especially in some of those countries in Latin America, because today Latin America is many things. It's tremendously heterogeneous. But there are some countries that are starting to get to that point where they can make that break. The one country in Latin America which is closer to breaking out of that middle income trap is Chile. And in Chile, which is, you know, in every indicator is one of the countries that has been able to advance significantly, has recently had you know, a lot of challenges in the question of education and in a number of areas where you begin to get to that level where they can break it. I'm sure they're going to make it because it's a country with a tremendous good, you know, institutions. What are the things that, you know, the variables that are important, certainly institutions, the quality of government, the quality and the competitiveness of the business sector, these are all elements that help a country make it through. And this is the case, um, certainly, of Chile. I'm sure that it's probably going to be the first Latin American country to break uh, that trap. That would be great. Um, well, we've, we've learned an awful lot today about uh, uh, the many wonderful ideas that are out there of trying to do more with less. But uh, unfortunately, the one thing that we've run out of is time. So um, it just leaves uh, it to me to uh, thank uh, our, our distinguished panel, Hans-Paul Buchner, uh, Bhaskar Chakravarti, Luis Moreno, Gao Jifan, uh, and Ashish Thakur. If you could join me in thanking them very much indeed. Thank you.